Good morning. It's good to see each of you this morning. It's good to be together for worship again. And uh, just to kind of give you an update, we started back over in the fel- in the church on Wednesday nights. Uh, this last Wednesday, we had 34 adults plus whatever uh, crowd Derek had over here. A lot of kids over here. So it's exciting to get back for our midweek service. I'd like to invite you to come out for that this next Wednesday over in the in the church building. So it's good to take another step to get back uh, to some sense of normalcy. But it's good to have you all here today. We've got a, uh, a friend with us this morning. Tim Throckmorton is the district director of ministry. Is that close enough? Close enough. With Family Research Council. And uh, he travels quite a bit, um, kind of... Um, in, in ministry of promoting uh, issues of faith, uh, family, and freedom. And uh, I appreciate Tim's ministry, and uh, we'll introduce him a little bit more here in a little while before he comes to speak. But um, it's good to have him with us and to hear a little bit about what his ministry is now, and then he's going to share with us from the Word of God this morning. So uh, the scripture reading for this morning comes from Isaiah 61, verses 10 and 11. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom doth himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. So that's the word of God this morning. Let's get our uh, hymn books. Dave's going to come and and lead us in our our hymn this morning. Let's sing out. Let's worship the Lord. Uh, Just like last week, we, we serve a risen Savior. So let's sing about it. Number 192, crown him with many crowns. 192, let's stand as we sing all four verses, let's stand. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne, our the heavenly anthem drowns, our music but its own Awake my soul and sing Of him who died for thee And hail him as thy matchless king Through all eternity Crown him the Lord of love Behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified, no angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but down with bends his wandering eye at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we seek who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through him given, from yonder glorious throne 
to Thee be endless praise, for Thou for us hast died. Be Thou, O Lord, through endless days adored and magnified. You may be seated, and Jennifer will come with our special music.
Thank you, Jennifer. I've known Tim Throckmorton for a long while now, I guess. We first met when I worked at the carpet store, and I would take my lunch hour and loaf at Timothy Scroll there in Wheelersburg, the Christian bookstore, Christian bookstore that, that Tim had at that time, and we got to know each other then, and, and we've become good friends, and, and uh, he is a, a true um, proclaimer of the Word of God. He loves the Word of God. He loves being with God's people. Uh, he, he pastored Plymouth Heights Church, the Nazarene, for many years before taking a new position at a church as pastor in Circleville, and from there he has uh, moved on to Family Research Council, and uh, it's a wonderful ministry. Uh, I'm anxious for him to share a little bit about that with you, but Tim has opportunity to really make a difference and to uh, represent uh, the church, God's people, before elected officials and to kind of lobby on our behalf, I guess you might say. Uh, and he's had opportunity to sit down with some folks maybe that one day you'd like to meet yourself. But uh, Tim's going to come and share with us from the Word of God and share a little bit about what he does. And uh, let's give him our undivided attention this morning as he breaks the bread of life for us. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. I uh, bring you greetings uh, from Tony Perkins the president of the Family Research Council. FRC, if you're not aware of who we are, uh, we were founded in 1983 by a fellow named James Dobson who thought it would be a pretty good idea for there to be a, uh, oh, a bastion of righteousness in our nation's capital. Uh, as a policy organization, uh, we have over the years spoken out on issues uh, rega in regard to family and, and religious freedom, and uh, of course life, the issue of life. That's one of the, the three main lanes that we run in. Uh, when we address issues nationally, the, uh, the issue of life, the issue of family, and the issue of religious freedom are where we speak mostly in, in those lanes. We vision a culture where life is valued, families flourish, and religious freedom thrives. My role is uh, as the Midwest Director of Ministry for the Family Research Council. I, I cover nine states, uh, however, uh, of the Midwest. Uh, yeah, last week I was in New Mexico and Texas, which I know are not in the Midwest, but that's where they sent me tomorrow. I'll jump on a plane and go to uh, Minnesota, and I'll be there for four days. But what I do is I speak to pastors, church leaders, denomination leaders, bringing to them the resources that the Family Research Council provides. If you go to frc.org or follow us on social media, you'll see our blog post, you'll see Tony's daily uh, radio show, uh, you'll see op-eds that are created by our policy shop. Um, our office is in Washington, so we speak biblically, now hear me, we speak biblically to cultural issues. And every day we are presenting and we are publishing and we are speaking out on, on the issues that I have uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. When it comes to the issue of life or family or religious freedom, and those are affected many, in many ways. And we've seen many great uh, victories. We've seen many pastors and church leaders from around the country getting engaged and involved at a level that, that I, I have never seen. So I am excited to be with my good friend Mark Price, uh, thank God for his leadership. You know you've got a pretty good pastor here. Would you, would you help me and just say thank you to your pastor for his leadership? I love this man. Amen. Appreciate you, Mark. God bless you. And the opportunity to spend time with you is very special to me as well. Well, it was a hot day. It was July. The year was 1787 when... Ben Franklin walked out of a brick building in downtown Philadelphia. Uh, many knew why they were there. They had gathered back. They had met earlier, 1774. They met down the street at Carpenter's Hall. In 1775, they met there. 1776, they met in that very same building and signed a document that changed the world. Really, the Declaration of Independence. And then in 1787, they, they came together again to form a government when Franklin walked outside, there was a dear woman there that said to him, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government did you give us? 
she said, or he said to her, a republic, if you can keep it. And what he meant by that was, here's a form of government that's unusual, unlike other forms of government, because it requires participation. If you can keep it, if you can maintain it, if you can participate in it, if you will give it due diligence, and if you will add your values to that structure of government, then you can keep it. Well, we are blessed to live here in the United States of America, as was said earlier in our Sunday school class. One, uh, 4%, only 4% of the population of the entire world, yet from this 4% of the population of the world, has come over the years more freedom than any other nation in the history of the world. More money given to missions than any, over 85% of all dollars given to worldwide missions comes from this little 4% of the world's population. 40% of the wealth of the world is here in this little 4% of the world's population. If there's a flood in Indonesia, if there's a hijacking in the Middle East, who do they call? Well, they call upon the United States of America, the men and women of the armed forces of the United States of America. Why? Because God has blessed this land, and we forget who we are and where we come from and what we need to be doing with this blessed government God has given us, we might just lose it. You've got a republic if you can keep it. There's a responsibility here, Franklin suggests. This is, a, this is something that, to me, comes out in Scripture as well. I think of the responsibility we have as believers. We've just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was the greatest Easter. I don't know about you, but I was really looking forward to Easter this year. My, it was wonderful to celebrate that. Paul, in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, kind of weaves his way through the, what we call the resurrection chapter, but he, he, he goes at great length, to great length, to declare to us that Jesus is risen from the dead. Now, that's why we're here on Sunday, by the way. We come here on Sunday because we believe Jesus rose from the dead. Can everybody say Amen. <laughs> amen. And he goes and he gives, he gives eyewitnesses. He tells who saw him and names names. And then he said there was hundreds that saw him at one time. Now, he, he waxes a little apologetic as he, as he talks about, you know, some say this didn't happen. And if it didn't happen and he lists all the reasons or all the things would be the by, byproduct if Jesus had not risen from the dead. But as he comes to the end of that 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul really gets wound up. He gets really emotional as he describes for us, Old death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brother, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Just like Franklin speaking to this sweet little lady. What kind of government? Well, there's, it's a republic, but you've got to do something. There's a responsibility that falls to you because of this. And Paul reminds us there's a responsibility to us because Jesus is alive, and we believe that. Because of that, therefore, be steadfast. Be unmovable. Be always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There are over 15,000 pastors in America that have, including yours, who have joined what we call the Watchman Pastors Network. It's built on Isaiah chapter 62 and, and verse number 6, which says, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. You that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent. Now, I know your pastor has, and many have been to the Middle East, and you've seen uh, the, the, uh, the desert that surrounds the uh, cities that's still there today. <laughs> and you, you've, you've seen perhaps some of the walled cities that still, still stand. And I've often imagined how that, you know, one of these young men or an older man who gets, gets home from a day of working or, 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 or finishes his job, his regular job, but then he's assigned a post on a, on a watchtower or on a, on a walkway at the, at, at the edge of the village looking out over the horizon. The watchman 
were unique and they were wonderful in their, in, their, in their work as they looked out at the horizon. Imagine that, if you will. Imagine coming home wore out, but it's your night to serve in the watchtower and you knew that your responsibility was to keep an eye on the horizon because if, if you saw something moving that shouldn't have moved, if you heard a sound that you shouldn't have heard, then your job was to, to, to report that or to sound the alarm. Because lives, lives that you love are at stake. That's why I think Franklin said what he said. The freedom that would be birthed because of this great republic would bring blessing and would bring life. It represented life. It put life first. But it wouldn't work if we didn't participate. Paul knew that the message of the resurrection would transform lives, but it wouldn't transform lives if we weren't steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The watchman on the wall knew that it was important that he pay attention. He knew that he needed to know his landscape. He needed to understand what he was looking at because if he made a mistake, lives were at risk. I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said, the soldier fights not because he hates those in front of him, but because he loves those who are behind. And we, here in this blessed land, have been handed a very important stewardship. And I'd like to take the, the thought of this, of this watchman whose job was, was, was what I would call a continual commitment. <laughs> it wasn't sporadic. It didn't just happen when he felt like it, but it needed to happen all the time for the sake of not only his life, but those that he influenced. Life or death was in the balance. An assignment, a very important assignment. Let's, let's notice together, firstly, as we look at this watchman, the, that he had a personal reality. He had a personal reality. It was his view of the city. If he was on this watchtower, that was what he looked at. He knew the, the, the rolling valleys. He knew the hillsides. He knew where the bushes were and the trees were. And if he came up to his post and the trees that were there yesterday were now over here, he knew he had a problem. Something needed to be done. People needed to know about this. Well, in our culture today, we have, a, we have a reality, the landscape, a culture. I, I've, I say this a lot, that our culture is struggling in, in three key areas. First of all, we have a biblically illiterate culture today. Biblically illiterate. Uh, George Barna says that only about 6% of those who call themselves Americans have a true biblical worldview, which is staggering. Six percent. There's biblical illiteracy. I would suggest to you that there's historical illiteracy. I'll talk about a little bit of our history today, but there are many who have no idea of the beautiful history of this great United States of America. What a blessing it is to live here, the freedoms that we enjoy. Do you know that from Genesis till this moment in time, everybody in recorded history that has lived under the freedoms that this nation has provided represents less than one percent of everybody that's ever lived. We are blessed. Amen. <laughs> We're blessed to live here in this great nation. There's civic illiteracy. What a day. Not, not many people know how government works. I've learned that a lot as I talk to people all around the country. Not everyone knows how government works, the structure of government, and why you need to be involved in, in this structure as Christians, bringing your worldview into that arena, influencing it for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the sake of others. One of the things I get to do is, is debate and um, speak in, in settings that, uh, where people have a lot of different opinions. Uh, I remember ABC News did a, uh, did a uh, town hall event at Ohio State University a few years ago, and I was there representing the traditional view of marriage, and they said, oh, come on, there'll be about half, of the, half with your view and half with, with another view. They, they don't know their fractions. They don't know their percentages. They, they were absolutely wrong. It's like 97.8% that were against me and just a few of us that were saying, this is what the Bible says. Well, a few years ago, 2019, I was invited to go to Worthington Kilbourne High School to speak to the poly rad class there. And my topic was the transgender movement in education. So I was going to bring a biblical worldview perspective on that issue. Then there was a, a gay priest that spoke just before I did, 
and, and gave a very different perspective. So I got up and I spoke. I talked about worldview. I talked about why I believe what I believe and, and, and all, all this. And, and a young man in the back raised his hand in, in the Q&A afterward, and he asked me a question. He said, sir, what would it take for you to change your worldview? I said, I can't think of anything. He said, no, what, what would it take? Something should make you or could make you change believe, believing what you believe. I said, I can think of nothing that would make me change my worldview. He said, well, what if your daughter came to you and said she was gay? Would you change your worldview? I said, no. And then he, same question, but about three, three different scenarios, you know. That what if this? What if this? And finally, he sits down so loud that you just took a chair and slammed it on the floor. That's, what, that's the sound you would get. And everyone turned and looked. He was obviously very agitated. After the Q&A, when everyone was done, he made a beeline right up to, to, my, uh, to my place in the front. He, he said, I want you to know I was not mad at you, to which I was a bit relieved. But he said, I was mad because you have something in your life that will not change. And it dawned on me, here's a 17 or 18-year-old boy in Columbus, Ohio, in a very affluent part of town who has never known an absolute truth in his life. We live in a, a culture that is vacant of truth, vacant of, of biblical understanding. It's vacant of civic understanding and uh, of historical understanding. In fact, you know in America today, 40% of the pastors in America today do not believe that hell is real. That's our perspective. That, that is what we see. Now, I say all of this not to depress you, but to remind you that God has entrusted you and I with the stewardship of this moment. God has handed this moment to us to be salt, to be light, to, to be a godly example in an ungodly world, to love people in Jesus' name. And let me tell you, more people are hungry and looking for Jesus than ever before in history. We are blessed to live here and to live now. Let me ask you to consider with me the, the watchman's personal responsibility. He had a perspective, and that was his. He looked at it, and he, was, he had a responsibility, though, that went along with his perspective. We have generations that have been robbed of, of, of our heritage, and I mentioned that a moment or two ago. There is the 1619 Project the New York Times and others have created to rewrite our history, and, and I don't know if you're aware of the 1776 Commission report that the president last year asked to be done. Larry Arn, who's a good friend, he's the president of Hillsdale College, and a number of other notables were on this uh, commission. And they created the 1776 Presidential Commission's report. It was on the White House website for a few days, and it, it vanished in January. I don't know why. And uh, then, it, But they moved it to the Heritage website, and it's also on... Um, uh, on uh, Hill, Hillsdale's site. You can see it. about 60 pages long. It is a concise record of American history just in a few pages. It's a great tool. But I, but I mention this because it's important. I believe that how a people views its own history is the way it behaves. Now think with me. Look at the book of Judges and the cycle of Israel. Seven times they forgot... They, that they should follow God. They forgot God. They forgot his laws. They forgot what he had done for them. And then, they, then they would get in trouble. Then they'd remember. Then they'd come back to God, and they would be blessed. And that cycle repeated itself seven times over and over again. They'd find the word of God, and they would read about who God was. And they, You mean it used to be like this? They'd remember their history, and then they would turn to him, and they would trust in him. I think of Stephen's message in the New Testament in the book of Acts, it's, it's, it's not so much a theological treatise as much as it is an historical account. Over and over, he would say to those as he spoke, recall the former days. Remember who we are. Remember where we came from. Daniel Webster, one of our founding fathers, said, history is nothing more than God's providence in human affairs. And Charles Kaufman, who wrote textbooks prior to the 1900s, wrote this, notice that while the oppressors have carried out their plans in history, there were other forces silently at work which in time undermined their plans as if a divine hand were directing a counterplan. Whoever peruses our story of liberty, without recognizing this feature, will fail to fully understand the meaning of our history. In other words, if you don't understand what God has been up to, you won't get the truth of history. We are blessed with a godly heritage. We are blessed with a godly heritage. May we never forget it. 
1774. In Virginia, the House of Burgess, which was the ruling leaders under the king's authority at the time, uh, heard about the Boston Port Act. Now, the King of England was a little upset about the tea party that they had had in Boston, and so he shut down commerce, and in doing so, the colonies began to suffer, and, and, and Americans, just regular Americans in Virginia, thought it would be a good idea to take action. And do you know what their first course of action was? Now, these are leaders like George Mason and Richard Henry Lee and Thomas Jefferson. They thought, we need to have a day of prayer and fasting. We're not going to do any business as leaders, as, as governors, as, as government leaders. We're going to pray and fast. And so they called. They passed a resolution. Everyone voted it to be true, and they're going to have a day of prayer and fasting. Now, the, the king's appointed governor, Lord Dunmore, heard about it, and he came running into the chamber there in, in Williamsburg, shaking the resolution, just castigating them for not calling on him and the king for help. And uh, he said, you're, you're all fired. In essence, he dismissed them, said, this assembly is done. You can leave. And there's a tall fellow in the back of the room named George Washington who said, gentlemen, follow me. And they went right down the street to a place called uh, Raleigh Tavern. And you can go, it's been rebuilt, but you can go in Williamsburg and see that right down the street from, from uh, the House of Burgess. And right there they did two things. They repassed the resolution calling for a day of prayer and fasting. And then they said, let's reach out to the other colonies and let's see if they would like to gather and discuss uniting as colonies or as states. And so in 1774, in the fall, in Philadelphia, at Carpenter's Hall, just a few doors down from Independence Hall, they met, representatives from the colonies met to discuss uniting as, as states. And before they did anything else, just like the Virginians, before they did anything else there, they called upon God for prayer. And I've got a picture hanging in my office that, that is a picture of Reverend Duche, who's on his knees before God with all the delegates around him, calling out to God for direction and help. That's what Americans do. Even, even John Adams said, he said to his wife Abigail, he said, the prayer of Reverend Duche caused even the Quakers to tear up. <laughs> well, they needed to meet again, and so in early 1775, they reached out to all the leaders in the colonies. They said, let's, let's elect people to come back in 1775. And so in Virginia, in Richmond, a guy by the name of Peyton Randolph sent out a notice. I've got a copy of that notice, and they, they brought people together. And in that gathering in Richmond, Virginia, at a place called St. John's Church, they heard from the delegates, they heard from speakers, and there was a man there by the name of Patrick Henry. You might remember him, or at least you would remember a line or two from his speech. Because he was listening to different people who said, you know what, we've just got to kind of get along and let things happen. And others said, well, let's just wait and see what happens. And he, he realized that, the, the, that what was about to take place would change everybody's life forever. And, and there, was, there was literally the choice between slavery and freedom. And he knew that it was coming to a head. And he, of course, at the end of his speech said, as for me, give me liberty or give me death. This is that important to me. Well, in the room was a pastor by the name of Mark Price. No, it wasn't Mark Price. The pastor's name was Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. I grew up in Pennsylvania, moved to Virginia to pastor. And he was pastoring in Woodstock, Virginia. And he was there, he was a clerk in his township, and he had gone there, he was involved, he knew what was happening around him, and, and he went back to his church after being at that little convention, and, and he, he was preaching, he was talking to his folks, we need to speak to the, we need to be involved, we need to be salt and light, we need to make a difference, this is important. And, and he was very impassioned uh, about what he was doing and what was happening around uh, him and them. And in early 1776, History tells us he preached a sermon from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 where the, the writer talks about the seasons, a time for peace and a time for war. And Muhlenberg said, this is a time for war. And he asked his men to join him. But before he did that, he took off his clerical robe. He had a, a robe on. We don't wear those. I know a few folks that do, but we don't wear those anymore. But under his clerical robe was the uniform of a continental officer. And he asks his men to join him. And 300 men join Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg to form the 8th Virginia Regiment. Right there in a church. 
They formed the 8th Virginia Regiment. They fought alongside General Washington. You can go to Valley Forge today, and you can see a sign that says the Muhlenberg Barracks, built by his men. Now, he also spoke to his people, and, and, and to his congregation, he said this, and this is just a quote from that particular morning. He said, you are placed by providence in the post of honor because it's the post of danger. Kind of reminds us of the day we live in. This is an amazing time. It's a tragic time and a challenging time, but God has placed us here. What a post it is. The eyes, he said, of not only North America and the whole British Empire, but all of Europe are upon you. Let us be therefore altogether solicitous that no disorderly behavior, nothing unbecoming our characters as Americans, as citizens and Christians, be justly chargeable to us. Now, as I've done this for a number of years, when I was at Plymouth Heights, I, I remember talking about the marriage amendment, and I remember going to Crossroads Church in Circleville and speaking biblically to cultural issues, and you're not going to, I know you're not going to believe this. Mark, you won't believe this. There were pastors that said, you shouldn't talk about that stuff. Really, there were. A lot of them. Said, you shouldn't talk political. Now, hear me. Look, look right at my baby blue eyes. <laughs> I'm not being political. I'm being biblical. Amen. Amen. I'm just being biblical. And as I would speak biblically to cultural issues, I can't tell you the hundreds of people who came to our church that said, thank you for saying something. Thank you for just saying something. The Bible talks about everything that's happening, by the way, in culture today. In America today, you know what the number one influence is? Anybody? TV. TV. Anybody else? You're close. You're number two. Internet. Internet. You know what? I would think that. But according to George Barna, no, we're going to go with Barna here, but we can argue with him later. Anybody else? According to Barna's 2017 study of culture in America, he asked the question, what's the number one influence in culture? And he did a deep dive into thousands of Americans asking them that question. According to Barna, the number one influence in culture today is movies. And I pushed him on that. I said, what do you, why? Movie? He said, because it's not just a movie. It is, a, it is a, a total thought aimed at culture that is built around not just a two or three hour segment, but all the lead up, all the follow up, all the series, all the products. All, it, it's, it's, a, it's a massive push to shape culture through movies. Movies, number one. Television, number two. Music, number three. Internet and social media, number four, which I thought, again, with you, would be higher. And um, uh, then uh, the uh, fifth one was uh, uh, books. Books was books. Then sixth was government. And seventh, family. To find the church in Barna's study in 2017, you've got to go to the bottom of the third tier as far as number one influences in culture. And I, I'm saying this to you because I truly believe that everybody in every church in America today understands every issue in culture today. I think they understand it based on something. <laughs> They understand the transgender movement. They understand same-sex marriage. They understand on and on. Just pick whatever topic you want based on something, the Word of God or those influences, which aren't necessarily going to underscore what the Word of God says is right and wrong. Amen. The watchman had a, a perspective. The watchman had a responsibility. And by the way, for those who want to... And, and there are many who say, well, we didn't have a, these guys weren't godly people. I want to remind you that the, the, the source, according to John Otis, who was a guy that mentored Sam Adams and John Hancock, and according to John Quincy Adams, a, a, a guy by the name of uh, Locke, John Locke, wrote a book called Two Treaties of Government. You can still buy the thing on Amazon today. According to those two, Locke's Two Treaties of Government was really the number one influence in the Declaration of Independence and many of the documents that were, that were formed in that, in that era, many of the proclamations that were formed in that era. And you might think, what's the big deal about John Locke's Two Treaties of Government? It's about a 400-page book. You can read it in an afternoon. But it quotes the Bible 1,500 times. 
And on and on studies go to find out where did our founders get their source? Where did they think? Where did they get their worldview? They got it from the world of, word of God. Lastly, the watchman had a personal reaction. He had something he needed to do. If he saw something was amiss and he loved those people that were behind him, he had a responsibility that called for some type of action, doing something. It matters what we do. As, as Muhlenberg said to his congregation, look, the world's watching us. The world's paying attention. I can testify to that. The world's dialed in. I've traveled uh, in mission work many, many times, and they ask a lot of questions. In fact, in Israel in 2014, I was at Temple Mount. This was during a little Gaza dust up over there when they were lobbing rockets into Israel, and we all got to watch the Iron Dome work while we were there. And we were at Temple Mount, and there were no tour buses there. If you've been to Israel, there are hundreds and hundreds of tour buses at every sacred site, and there were none. There were little vans because there were hardly any people. And we were there at Temple Mount out one particular afternoon and a little entourage came our way and it was Uzi Landau. He was at that time the minister of tourism in Israel, a member of the Israeli cabinet. And he found out who we were. I was with a, a group of leaders from the Midwest, about 14 of us, and we were standing there and we were introducing ourselves. When he got to me, I was the token pastor for the trip and doing devotions for the, for the folks that were there. And, and he asked me what I did. I said, I'm a pastor in Ohio. And he said, where's that? I said, it's in the Midwest. And he said, uh, well, you know, he said, we know. And this is we. This is a member of the Israeli cabinet. He said, we know that if the church in America is good, and the church in America is good, the church, the, the nation of America will be strong. And we know that if America is strong, then Israel will be blessed. That's a perspective from the Middle East. Last year, as I was in uh, uh, Philadelphia with pastors, just before the election, I was talking to, her name was Asiya Nasir. She's a former member of the Pakistan parliament. And she was at one of our pastors' gatherings there. And she told me, she said, oh, we realize just how much the church in America can make the difference, not just for America, but for everyone in the world. It's important. See, this responsibility uh, and our reaction affects not only you and, and me, but it affects many around the world. Their freedoms, what they get to enjoy, or the persecution that they must endure. What we produce at the Family Research Council uh, in print or digitally is, is free. We give it away. We speak to every topic, the LGBTQ movement, how do, you, how do you address the transgender movement in education, how do you speak about religious freedom, how do churches address uh, issues that appear to be political, how or why should people get involved in government, why should we bring our biblical worldview into the realm of government, why is this important for us to be salt and light, and on and on, of the hundreds and hundreds of pieces that we have, uh, they're all available di in digital format, but we work also to produce real-time information. If you want to understand understand something that happened last week, I invite you to check out frc.org. Follow us on social media. Download the app. It's called the Stand Firm app. I encourage you to download that. Carry it on your phone. And uh, there's a real-time feed because what happens in Washington or what happens in the Middle East, what happens that affects life and family and freedom, we're speaking to those issues on a daily basis in a real-time way. And we want to be a trusted source. Everything's duly footnoted. We want to make sure that you can, you know, you can quote us. I, I had a mentor years ago in ministry. His name is Talmadge Johnson. He lives in Nashville now. And he would say to us preacher boys, he would say, the world at its worst needs the church at its best. The world at its worst needs the church at its best. God's entrusted these moments to you and I. It takes courage. I know it does. For Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, his brother, his own brother, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, who pastored in New York City, said, Pete, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't speak on those things. You shouldn't get involved like that. And, and he felt strongly about that until the British came and burned his church. <laughs> and he said, well, maybe I ought to do something. And he did. He joined the militia. He fought alongside Washington as well. And at the end of the war, by the way, if you, if you go to the, uh, it's not hanging up here. Some places I go, they have them hanging up. Uh, the, the Bill of Rights, 
the Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, all three documents go together. And in the Bill of Rights, if you, if you look at it, go to the bottom right-hand corner of the Bill of Rights. There are two, two signatures. One is the Vice President, John Adams. Right above it is the Speaker of the House of Representatives, a pastor by the name of Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, Speaker of the House. We have it. By the way, in Ohio, you know there are three legislators in Ohio that are pastors. One is the Speaker Pro Tem. He's in, his name's Tim Gentry, pastors in Salem, Ohio. Pastors have always been involved. Pastors have always been influential. The, ch the church in America has always been influential. But in today's time, and in this moment of history, where even if you say you're a Christian, you're often categorized or recategorized or titled or attacked, I understand it's, it's tough. It takes courage. I know that. C.S. Lewis in the screw tape letters wrote this, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at its breaking point. Everyone at its breaking point. Courage is what holds on and stands up and stands true and does not change. That, that is steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord, regardless of what Hollywood says or what Washington says or what anybody says, preaches and teaches and lives a godly life in a godly world because the world's counting on us to do the right thing. It was August 1814. I'm going to fast forward and we're going to land this thing. August 1814, Dolly Madison was preparing lunch for her husband, the president, when a, uh, a young man came running in and said that the president wouldn't be coming to lunch, but the British were. <laughs> so they grabbed what they could. You know, she took the picture of Washington, and they got out of there. The British came in, literally ate the lunch, and then burned the, the building. Now, they had attacked this fledgling nation, thinking that what they couldn't do in, uh, in, in the 1700s, they were going to accomplish here. And so they needed to attack uh, two key places. One was the seat of government, which was Washington, D.C., this little area that uh, had been designated as our national capital. And then they needed to attack the military, uh, the military bastion or the military force of this young nation, which was in Baltimore. And so they, as they were marching from Baltimore down to D.C. to burn it, they were passing through a little place called Upper Marlboro. And when they were going through, the people heckled them and threw things at them and made fun of them. And, and so they, uh, on their way back to Baltimore, they grabbed uh, as a hostage their beloved doctor from that little village. His name was Dr. Bean. And so they took him back. They put him on a ship uh, in the harbor at Baltimore. They were getting ready to attack there. And so the good folks of Upper Marlboro thought we need to, we need to get him back. And th they hired an attorney. And you can't just go knock on the door of a, another country. You've got to get a presidential envoy, and even in that day. So President Madison uh, uh, asked Colonel John Skinner to go along uh, with the attorney, whose name was Francis Scott Key, and they went up to Baltimore. They went out on the ship, and they were negotiating the, the release of Dr. Bean. Uh, while they were out there on the ship, uh, they had letters from people who, and even British soldiers, who said Dr. Bean was a good guy. He was a fine man. And uh, finally the general said, okay, we'll release him, but you can't leave because we got some business to do here in, in Baltimore. And, and you know where Fort McHenry is. Fort McHenry is that star-shaped fort in Baltimore. It was the bullseye. If you're going to aim at the government, you aim at Washington, D.C. If you're going to aim at the military forces of this young nation, you aimed them right at Fort McHenry. Now, to push pause for a minute, the, the, the commander at Fort McHenry was a fellow by the name of Armistead. And he knew what was building up. They all knew what was building up. And he knew that the British would aim for him. And this is, this is an American for you. This, this fella said, okay, they're going to they're gonna come here. I don't want them to misunderstand that we mean business. And so he, he had this flag made. They hired a little girl by the name of Mary Pickerskill to build this flag. And it's 400 yards of wool. That's a lot of wool today. And it was, it was then. 15 stars. There were two foot from point to point. Uh, white stripes, two foot wide. The whole flag was 42 foot wide, 30 foot tall. And Armistead said, park it right in the middle of the fort. I don't want them to miss us. <laughs> and so there they are. It, it was September the 13th, 1814. And the British began their bombardment. Now I want to tell you something that you may not may not know, I never knew this, 
until I went there. 22 merchants in Baltimore took their own ships and sunk them in the harbor. They, they sunk their own ship. They gave up their, their living so that the ships from the British couldn't get close to the fort. They sunk the ships so the British couldn't get in there, so they had to fire rockets. So they had this new rocket called a Concreve rocket, and it was... Uh, uh, it, 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 would, it, would, it would go uh, in the air and it would wobble and it would weave and it would create this red uh, flame throughout the sky. And then they had these bombs that would, would explode upon impact and they fired, I think, 1,500, 2,000 of those bombs in, 200 pounds. They had lighted fuses and some of them would blow up in the air. And so here the bombardment begins. They could only get so close and the British start bomb bombing Fort McHenry. And you know the story, how that throughout the night, the bombs would blast and, the, and they would see that flag. He, on the deck of the ship, would see the flag. He knew that if the flag was there, that they were still standing. And it, late in the night, the, the bombing stopped and he was worried and all the people were worried. And what he didn't know was that the British had tried a land assault, but good Americans, just like the folks that sunk their ships, Good Americans met the British in the reeds, in the swampy area, coming as they came on land and pushed them back with guns and, and pitchforks and whatever they could find. Just Americans did that. And because of that, they gave up, said, it's, we can't win this thing. And so when the daylight came and Francis Scott Key looked out across the harbor, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming? These broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave? But it's the fourth, fourth verse, the last verse that always gets me. It always touches my heart. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their blessed home and war's Desolation, blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto in God is our trust. And the star spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Who wouldn't stand for that? Who wouldn't stand hearing those words? Someone years ago said, the fruit of our lives grows on the trees of others. I've got a granddaughter. She's nine now. Uh, she was six when I left the church to go work for the Family Research Council. In Washington, we, we travel everywhere, and so every week I would be going somewhere. But when I first told her I wasn't going to be pastoring, she, she was six again. She looking up my pat me, big puppy dog eyes. Papa, what are you going to do? I tried, I tried for about a half a minute to explain. I gave up. I just said, honey, I'm just, I'm trying to save America for you. That's all I said. She said, okay. <laughs> she just trotted off. Next day at school, her teacher who knew us said, heard your grandpa's retiring. She said, nope, he's saving America. <laughs> Sunday after Sunday, when she's with me, she'll ask me, where are you going, Papa? Where's, where, where are you going next? Last week it was New Mexico. and Tonight I'll see her going to Minnesota tomorrow, and we'll talk about the state and all of that. But she will say to me today, today she'll say this. She says it every Sunday. Are you going to try to save America for me? Yeah. Last year on a conference call, the vice president said to a group, Mark, you probably were on this call with us. He said, the gospel was made for times like these. That's a great line. But I'd go farther and say this. You, everyone in this room, were made for times like these. Would you join me in praying for our great land as we close our time together tonight? Stand with me. Father, thank you for these in this place. Lord, before we gather to pray and focus our prayer just on this nation, Lord, I pray for those who may be watching, who maybe, Lord, who are here today, who have a need in their life. The resurrection is true. Jesus, we know you're alive. 
And we need to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in your work, because souls are making decisions daily. And so if there's someone here today who doesn't know you as their Savior, may they seek you while you can be found. May they call upon you while you are near. We're so glad that, that if we do that, if we seek you with all of our heart, we can find you. And for those who may be hurting that, that need to seek you today, may they bring their hurts and their needs to you. Oh God, touch each one. Supply every need according to your riches in glory. May each heart be blessed. May each soul be satisfied. And may we, trusting, trusting in you alone, not, not our government, not, uh, not Wall Street, but trusting in you alone, know the peace that passes all understanding. So bless Bless this great church. Bless each one that's here, each one that uh, has heard our time together today, and may you be honored in these moments. And Lord, have your way in us and through us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing, and then I'm going to...